You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 18, 2016, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, rhinitis. Our presenter is Dr. Mark Dykowitz. He's the Raymond and Alberta Slavin Endowed Chair and Chief of Allergy Immunology at St. Louis University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Our speaker is Dr. Mark Dykowitz, um, and he is going to speak to us on rhinitis, a primer for specialists. And rhinitis is something that uh, allergy, allergists and allergy fellows will see a lot. Dr. Dykowitz is from uh, St. Louis, St. Louis University, uh, coming to us over the uh, COLA network. Dr. Dykowitz, please go ahead. It's uh, my pleasure to be uh, with everyone this morning. Thanks again for offering me the opportunity to talk to you about, as you indicate, a, a very common disease that we deal with, and we want to do it right. Um, looking at my disclosures, there we go. Uh, nothing really is relevant to the presentation. Our objectives are to better distinguish between allergic and non-allergic forms of rhinitis and also review key differential considerations. Also would like uh, you to be able to better select treatments for both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis. And then uh, as we get more evidence bases for using combination therapies to better understand the evidence for using, or in some cases not using, a combination therapies for rhinitis. First, we'll talk about definition. Uh, it's a very important uh, problem, rhinitis, that we'll talk about. I do want to distinguish between different types of rhinitis that are out there. Uh, again, review differential considerations, but uh, spend uh, then time on diagnosis with a lot on treatment. Well, by definition, uh, guidelines have come to the point of saying that rhinitis is characterized by one or more of the following symptoms, and the four key symptoms are nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, which could be anterior or post-nasal drip, sneezing, or itching. Now, inflammation is implied by the itis in the rhinitis term. However, realize that inflammation is present uh, in allergic rhinitis, but not in all types of non-allergic rhinitis, which actually comprise a lot of patients walking into the office. Overall, uh, allergic rhinitis is the sixth most prevalent chronic illness and, and maybe the most chronic chronic condition in children. Um, and as you see, it's a highly prevalent uh, disorder in both adults and children um, with estimates varying to range there. It's also important to treat rhinitis and recognize it and uh, deal with it because of its comorbidity. Um, and, and there is some evidence that appropriate management of rhinitis can be an effective uh, component of management of coexisting or complicating respiratory conditions. And this includes um, asthma, sinusitis, and sleep apnea. There's also tremendous cost both because of direct medical costs, but also indirect costs to society because they missed school and work. And actually, speaking about missed school or work, we're not just talking about absenteeism, but also presenteeism. That is to say, people show up for work, kids go to school, and they're there, but they're really not uh, functioning at a good level. And if you see in this um, figure, the mean productivity loss uh, per employee per year uh, for on the left-hand side allergic rhinitis versus a lot of other uh, medical conditions, uh, allergic rhinitis is right up there. So a tremendous impact on society. There are several major rhinitis guidelines. Uh, one of them I have been um, very involved with is a co-editor with Dr. Dana Wallace. Uh, the last full um, publication was in 2008. We are currently working on a revision that we hope to have uh, at least a focus document uh, completed even in the next couple of months. Then there's the allergic rhinitis in asthma guidelines, which is 
uh, predominantly European driven, but does have representation from people um, all across the world. Um, there recently was, in 2015, a guideline that was a consensus document. Um, it was published by the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. I represented the Quad AI. Dr. Wallace represented the ACAAI. And um, it is focused purely on allergic rhinitis, but it does also give uh, up-to-date recommendations on the uh, allergic rhinitis aspect of the broader uh, scheme of rhinitis. So our major categories of rhinitis are allergic, non-allergic that we're going to talk about. And then the reality is uh, people can have mixed problems with both allergic and non-allergic uh, rhinitis. And it is estimated that roughly a third of the patients walking into offices would have pure allergic. Some uh, one third would have non-allergic rhinitis, but a lot, another third might have uh, components of both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis. Um, this uh, slide and the following there are uh, from a table in the Joint Task Force Practice Parameter on Rhinitis. It shows you the panoply of different types of rhinitis that can occur. I only show this on this presentation to have you recognize there's a lot out there. There are also, as we'll talk about, um, nasal symptoms that can be associated with inflammatory and immunologic disorders. To start right off with allergic rhinitis, this is, of course, IgE, allergic antibody mediated. Common allergic triggers include pollens, and in most temperate climates, you're seeing a seasonal pattern uh, versus uh, uh, some other uh, allergens, including indoor allergens, that can give you year-round problems. Um, molds can be a problem both year-round. Uh, in fact, there at uh, Children's Mercy, the research was done that was showing that in house dust, um, uh, molds can be present uh, on a year-round basis. Now, this does get into the whole um, use of the term seasonal, perennial, uh, what we call episodic environmental, intermittent persistent, and occupational. So there's a little bit that should be said about those um, different terms. Um, I would say that using this example that we already gave about um, pollen, so it's a grass pollen, in the Midwest, that would definitely be a seasonal problem. But if you're talking about some warmer climates um, where there isn't frost, you could see grass pollen uh, actually causing perennial uh, allergic rhinitis problems. Now, why should we try to classify allergic rhinitis by different characteristics? Well, this is one way that you can better define the subpopulation for conducting clinical trials. But also, it really assists you in the selection of the most appropriate treatment for an individual patient with allergic rhinitis. So you can classify allergic rhinitis by the temporal pattern in the context of exposure. We've already talked about seasonal versus perennial. Uh, the Joint Task Force introduced the term episodic implied environmental rhinitis, where you have episodic exposures to allergens that normally aren't in your environment. Let's say you normally are not around a cat but you have to go to a relative's home that has a cat and you're allergic to the cat, you would have episodic environmental uh, allergic rhinitis in uh, response to the exposure to that cat. Also, there is the discussion of frequency of symptoms. Now, the ARIA guidelines have defined this most specifically, and they use the term intermittent, which is less than four days per week or less than four weeks per year. Uh, versus persistent, where you have more than four days per week and greater than four weeks per year. Um, this isn't perfect, but it sometimes can uh, give some sense as to the types of medications that you might choose for the patient when you would give them. Also, in talking about mild versus more severe rhinitis, essentially um, more severe rhinitis is when symptoms uh, are beginning to interfere with quality of life, including sleep impairment, uh, impairment of activities in school and work. Now let's talk about non-allergic rhinitis, for which the nomenclature is variable. So let's go into some of that. Well, first of all, just to set it aside, we certainly could state that if somebody gets a viral upper respiratory infection, that is some acute infectious uh, non-allergic rhinitis. 
But in the context of what we're seeing uh, for patients walking to our office, most commonly these are somewhat more persistent chronic disorders. If you look in the big scheme of things, uh, as I've already uh, alluded to in a previous slide, maybe one-third of the patients um, with rhinitis across the board have non-allergic problems. So there are a couple terms, perennial non-allergic rhinitis, PNAR. Uh, another one we'll talk about a little bit more, vasomotor rhinitis. Um, and idiopathic, and depending on which guideline you're looking at and tradition, one or other of these terms may be used. There's also a subset of non-allergic rhinitis, which has eosinophilic um, inflammation of the nose, and that's NARI, or non-allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia. And in fact, the, the problem about uh, defining uh, different categories of non-allergic rhinitis is pretty vexing. There was an NIAID workshop conducted several years ago, and the aftermath is still um, leading to some further definition of terms. It's not an easy uh, consensus uh, uh, approach that's been established yet. So for perennial non-allergic rhinitis, also known as vasomotor rhinitis, also known as idiopathic, um, you don't have eosinophilia. There typically is a less favorable natural course. Patients tend to be somewhat more resistant to treatment. Uh, symptoms can vary depending from the individual from obstruction to congestion to rhinorrhea. Now, versus allergic rhinitis, you're less commonly going to be getting a patient talking about sneezing, nasal itching, or eye symptoms in non-allergic rhinitis. The term vasomotor rhinitis um, merits a, a, a moment to talk about. Sometimes that is a term that's been used synonymously with non-allergic rhinitis without eosinophilia, but Sometimes there is this connotation that nasal symptoms are being provoked by non-allergic factors. Now, in fact, even though it says vasomotor, there, there is not a, a clear um, understanding that this has anything to do uh, with vasculature. But nonetheless, um, the vasomotor rhinitis terms might imply that acute changes in the external environment are causing rhinitis symptoms. That could be sudden changes in ambient temperature. Uh, walking in or out of an air-conditioned building in the summertime, uh, exposure to odors or irritants such as perfumes, uh, passive cigarette smoke exposure. Um, alcohol, by virtue of its vasodilatory effect, does in fact have some, if you will, vasomotor um, uh, underlying cause of rhinitis. And then there are other factors including exercise, sexual arousal, and emotional factors that can play a role as well. Now, the FDA these days is now viewing the importance of trying to define different subsets of patients with rhinitis um, uh, that have these types of triggers with the idea being just because something might be of some benefit in a patient who is predominantly bothered by ambient temperature changes doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be a treatment that's going to um, help people who are bothered by odors or irritants. A few words about non-allergic eosinophilic rhinitis, or NARES. Uh, this, in different studies, can be up to a third of patients with non-allergic rhinitis. Anosmia is very common, and the patients are more likely to have more severe symptoms than um, other types of non-allergic rhinitis or allergic rhinitis. So some patients will evolve on to having nasal polyposis and aspirin sensitivity. Typically, there is good response or uh, uh, notable response to intranasal corticosteroids. I should also mention an entity called local, local allergic rhinitis, sometimes referred to as nasal entity. It's been reported that in some patients you can get local IgE production but without uh, evidence of allergy as assessed by doing skin testing or in vitro blood testing uh, for IgE. The patients in the studies have been defined as having positive nasal allergen challenges. There's been some uh, suggestion that these patients might also have a basophil activation test uh, to allergens. But um, this is actually one of the issues that the Joint Task Force Rhinitis Workgroup um, that I'm co-chairing is dealing with because we really 
need to have larger multi-center well control studies in both kids and adults to better define how prevalent this is, the natural history, and how to best diagnose, this, diagnose and treat it. I, more or less, let's put it in here for completeness at this point. We don't know what to, to quite do with it practically. Um, I do want to mention food-induced gustatory rhinitis, which is rhinorrhea occurring immediately after food ingestion. It's a cholinergic process. Uh, hot, spicy foods might be more likely to cause the problem, but for some patients, it can occur from any food. Um, you can also define the nasal congestion after drinking alcoholic beverages um, as a form of gustatory rhinitis. One thing that is very important to keep in mind is that IgE-mediated food allergy as a cause of isolated rhinitis symptoms um, it really is rare if it occurs. Um, if somebody has food allergy, they should be having other manifestations of a food allergic reaction than simply rhinitis. Other important rhinitis syndromes to keep in mind would be those that are drug-induced. Very commonly, uh, we will see patients who have rhinitis medicamentosa, where they, if you will, have become addicted to using topical nasal decongestant sprays. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes. Cocaine can also cause that. Some people will have rhinitis symptoms with aspirin and non anti-inflammatory drugs, particularly in older uh, populations where ACE inhibitors are commonly prescribed. You should keep in mind that uh, patients can have nasal symptoms uh, of both congestion and uh, rhinorrhea. They do not need to know or they do not need to have cough. Uh, ACE inhibitor-induced cough, of course, is quite common but there are plenty of patients out there that will have more isolated nasal symptoms without cough, and that should be kept in mind. Uh, other medications, including beta blockers, antihypertensives, and oral contraceptives uh, can promote rhinitis. You should take a good history, therefore, to see what medications the patient is taking to see if they might be having some component of medication-caused rhinitis. And then speaking of hormones with oral contraceptives, there are other hormonal disorders, including hypothyroidism, a pregnancy, particularly during the last trimester, and women during uh, menstrual cycles can see variation in rhinitis symptoms. Also, there is a clear entity where GE reflux can be so severe that it actually can get into the nasal mucosa and cause rhinitis. Speaking a bit more of rhinitis medicamentosa, this occurs with ongoing use of nasal decongestant sprays um, and results uh, in the downregulation of alpha adrenergic receptors. Basic treatment would be to use intranasal corticosteroids, uh, but you sometimes have to bridge the treatment of the patient with a burst of oral steroids to get the edema down so that the patients uh, can, if you will, get off of their um, addiction to the nasal decongestant sprays. What you have to keep in mind, though, is uh, evaluating why do they get hooked on nasal decongestant sprays in the first place? Do they have some underlying uh, chronic uh, rhinitis, allergic, non-allergic uh, rhinitis? Or sometimes what you'll see is somebody doesn't have any pre-existing history of rhinitis. They catch a cold, they start using the nasal decongestant spray, and then they just never seem to be able to get off of it. So take a history of whether it had a very acute onset with that type of a context. There are also a number of structural and mechanical factors that can mimic uh, rhinitis, and that could include deviated septum. Uh, usually a deviated septum will cause unilateral congestion, but you can see um, almost uh, S-shaped uh, septal deviations that can result in bilateral congestion. Hypertrophic turbinates, particularly inferior turbinates, can be responsible for nasal symptoms. And then there are other differential considerations, including adenoidal hypertrophy, uh, foreign bodies in children, uh, kids putting peanuts in their nose. Uh, but also be mindful that there can be nasal tumors and uh, colonial uh, atresia. Nasal polyps certainly can present with nasal symptoms that could be confused with more standard run-of-the-mill rhinitis. Uh, you should also keep in the back of your mind the entity of uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, CSF rhinorrhea. 
which is typically unilateral. If somebody came to you talking about unilateral rhinorrhea, you should think about this right off the bat. It can occur post-traumatically, but it may occur spontaneously. One thing that can be done diagnostically looking at the nasal discharge is for the presence of beta-2 transparents, which would not be present in nasal secretions. You can also check the glucose levels, which would be akin to what you would see in CSF. And then uh, there are other um, serious systemic disorders that can cause nasal symptoms, uh, Wegener, sarcoid, lupus, Sjogren's, um, and I won't uh, belabor those further. So you're taking a uh, history. A uh, physical exam is being performed. You are doing allergy testing if indicated, and then looking at uh, the diagnosis sometimes with additional diagnostic testing. So in taking a history, first of all, ask, what are the bothersome symptoms? Uh, is it runny nose? Is it nasal congestion, sneezing, or itching? And again, the presence of itching would steer you away from thinking this is non-allergic rhinitis. Uh, asking about which symptoms are important can also be important for deciding which treatments to use. Some treatments are better suited for certain symptoms. Also ask about associated eye symptoms such as itchy, watery, red, or swollen eyes. Uh, again, as I mentioned, these associated eye symptoms are more common in allergic than non-allergic rhinitis. We've already talked about trying to identify the pattern of rhinitis, whether it's seasonal or perennial. Uh, that could have implications as to when you're treating patients, uh, as well as uh, what type of um, diagnosis you're giving them. Um, and it is of value, I think, to figure out how infrequent or frequent are the symptoms, whether there's episodic environmental exposures that are causing problems. Because there are different medication strategies that can be used for these different types of uh, rhinitis. Uh, you should be asking about effects of home versus school or work, so you should take detailed environmental history. Um, whether there's a uh, greater problem outdoors, which suggests outdoor allergens, versus indoors, which suggests indoor allergens. And then you ask about acute symptoms with house dust mites, mold, cutting grass. Uh, is actually a good mold question because you are um, disrupting the mold at the basis of the blades of grass and getting them aerosolized, and of course acute exposures with uh, pets. Good question to ask, especially relative to the pet story, is if uh, a patient does have a pet in their home and they go away on vacation and they're better away from the pets, that uh, is uh, some evidence anyway that the pets are uh, a significant problem. Of course, you're going to also ask whether people have problems with food, uh, gustatory rhinitis, and again, review drugs that they're taking. Uh, with ACE inhibitors, for instance, it is something that just similar to ACE inhibitor induced cough may not happen right away, and it could develop uh, uh, after the patient's been on it for quite some time. Uh, specific points of history to consider would also be in terms of the nasal congestion. Normally, there should be shifting of blood flow from one side to the other every four to eight hours. Uh, so-called nasal cycling. So if you have a patient who is saying that they have uh, predominantly one-sided congestion, you should be thinking about an anatomic cause, uh, such as a septal deviation. It could be nasal polyps or other problems, too. I'll ask, of course, about if the patient's already taken medicines, uh, what was their response? And especially in this day and age, we now have nasal corticosteroids over the counter, as well as uh, nasal, or rather, uh, oral antihistamines ask what they've taken, figure out whether they really gave it a fair shot. Uh, it wasn't just a, a spray or two, and then they gave up the chip. Uh, and then uh, make an assessment from there whether you should be going to a different type of a treatment, or maybe in terms of, let's say, a nasal steroid, just enhancing uh, the uh, adherence and um, giving instructions on optimal use. Um, I think one of the more um, common differential considerations is sinusitis, uh, certainly in some patients you can get a story that there'll be an acute onset of nasal symptoms with thereafter persistent symptoms after an upper respiratory infection, and that would be suggestive. Now, of course, you can ask about things like headache and purulent drainage. Uh, 
um, that might increase the likelihood that sinusitis is present, but uh, even the destruction, uh, the decomposition, if you will, of eosinophils uh, from allergic rhinitis in the nasal mucosa uh, can lead to purulent looking drainage. So that's not a be-all or end-all. You should be asking about the presence of coexisting conditions such as asthma, sleep apnea, or acid reflux. And of course, the family history of allergic disorders would increase the likelihood that the patient sitting in front of you has allergic problems. Actually doing the physical exam, looking at the nose, pay particular attention to the septum. Is it deviated? Are there any mucosal ulcers or erosions, particularly in the septum? Um, look at the turbinate. Uh, are they so swollen that spraying a nasal spray is not going to get anywhere? And the patient may need, if they're going to go that route, a short-term use of a nasal decongestant spray or sometimes oral steroid. Uh, also take a look at the mucosa and uh, the mucus, whether it's purulence, but again, as I've just mentioned, that doesn't necessarily give you a clear clue about whether it's allergic, non-allergic, or infectious. Um, obviously, look for nasal polyps. And because there's a lot of connectedness uh, to the nose, also take a look at the eyes, the ears, the oral pharynx, and examine the lungs because of the high prevalence of concomitant asthma. Specific IgE determination, uh, of course, can be very helpful. It can be done either by immediate type skin testing, which we generally prefer, or in vitro tests. And knowing if somebody's allergic or not can assist in the selection of different pharmacotherapeutic options, some of which have no value if the patient ends up having non-allergic rhinitis. Also, it can help identify specific allergens, so that can lead you to giving some directed uh, focused allergen avoidance measures, or when appropriate, prescribing targeted allergen immunotherapy. Now, in the big picture of treatment, uh, we're looking at avoidance measures, environmental control measures, how this might cover avoiding pets. Uh, I think that's covered in other lectures, so I'm not going to uh, belabor that more. So we're going to focus more today on pharmacologic therapy, but in context, we must also remember that uh, allergen immunotherapy can be an important component of optimal treatment of allergic rhinitis. So looking at different pharmacologic therapies, um, as you're going to decide what to uh, prescribe the patient, think about what type of rhinitis is present. Is it allergic, non-allergic, or mixed? Is it seasonal, which might make you think actually uh, timing the medications to begin even a week or so before the anticipated allergy season? If patients are having more frequent uh, symptoms um, versus intermittent symptoms, if it's uh, infrequent intermittent symptoms, you would probably want to choose an agent that has rapid onset of action that the patient might end up using on a PRN basis, whereas if there are more persistent symptoms, uh, even an agent that has a slower onset uh, of action may be a better bet if it ends up being more effective. Uh, with Already alluded to the fact that depending on the type of symptoms the patient has, you'll choose different medications. So if nasal congestion is a major problem, uh, generally speaking, an oral antihistamine or a leukotriene receptor antagonist are not going to be great choices. A nasal steroid, for example, or an intranasal antihistamine would um, likely do a better job with congestion. In terms of severity, here again, um, if you've got more severe symptoms, you would not be using as monotherapy an oral antihistamine or a leukotriene receptor agent. You'd be uh, ramping up, if you will, to the intranasal preparation. And also, there are considerations that come into play with children. I mean, children may be less likely to tolerate nasal sprays. Um, we'll talk about uh, issues of growth with nasal steroids in children. Um, which in contact is not a huge concern, but it's something that has to be considered. And then senior patients are more likely to get into adverse 
problems uh, with certain medications, particularly sedating oral antihistamines. That has to be kept in mind, too. All right. A little slow responsiveness here from St. Louis. Uh, one thing I would um, commend to you is to look at the Joint Task Force Practice Parameter on rhinitis. There's one particular table where we try to distill different therapeutic considerations for different treatments for rhinitis. And it's a, a quick and easy way, particularly for um, recently starting fellows, to get up to snuff about uh, understanding the nuances of different treatments. And uh, there also was some effort, even though it was 2008, to try to put together what are the uh, evidence or what is the evidence basis for different combination therapies. All right, let's go through the different monotherapies. Generally speaking, intranasal corticosteroids are the most effective medications for allergic rhinitis. Uh, keep in mind although a number of medicines help for both allergic and non-allergic, if you've got non-allergic, you're not going to get uh, significant benefit with oral antihistamines, oral antileukotrienes, or nasal chromalins, so they shouldn't be used. And then combination therapy should be considered when symptoms aren't fully controlled with monotherapy. But as we'll discuss, uh, combos aren't always better. Um, some combos are more effective than others. As you prescribe intranasal preparation, keep in mind a few basics. Uh, just don't prescribe it, uh, but give the patient instruction on how to avoid spraying medially towards the septum, which might cause erosions or even in rare cases, nasal septum perforation. And then because some people will complain about the so-called grippage of uh, nasal sprays and for certain preparations, the perception of adverse taste, um, in our clinic, we often will talk about uh, bending your head down in a nose-to-toes technique uh, to try to reduce that uh, type of problem, and we tell people to stay in the down position for 20, 30 seconds before they stand up. They obviously administer the sprays while they are in an upward uh, direction. Um, I think it's also good clinical uh, practice to have the nasal septum periodically examined for mucosal erosions in our clinic. Uh, every 6 to 12 months uh, after patients been initially seen, uh, we like to uh, have the patient back to take a look at the nasal septum, make sure that that looks okay. And as we've already talked about, for intermittent or infrequent allergic rhinitis or episodic environmental rhinitis, you'd like to choose an agent with a rapid onset of action. So that brings up a question. According to the Joint Task Force, which of the following agents is not recommended for a patient with episodic allergic rhinitis? So your choices are oral antihistamine, intranasal antihistamine, intranasal corticosteroid, or oral antileukotriene. And the answer is oral antileukotriene for the following reason. If you look at the onset of action with different medication classes, uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists uh, start kicking in by the second day, whereas you see the other examples there, you can get much quicker relief of symptoms, and those would be better suited for uh, rapid onset in that context of the patient. In terms of nasal steroids, again, they are generally the most effective monotherapy. They also have uh, particular merit in patients who have nasal congestion. They can be used on a somewhat PRN basis. Uh, there was one study that looked at more than 50% days used to fill PRN, and then decide whether that was PRN or not. But that was still found to be uh, significantly more effective for seasonal allergic rhinitis than placebo. Uh, nasal steroids are generally, as monotherapy, more effective than a combo of oral antihistamines and leukotriene receptor antagonists for allergic rhinitis. And um, the onset of action in comparison to intranasal antihistamines is less rapid. Uh, you can see some improvement within 12 hours, uh, even a couple hours, three to four hours, but oftentimes it's a, a week or two before you get into full benefit. Um, so uh, they could be considered for episodic allergic rhinitis. Uh, interestingly, 
um, for release of associated ocular symptoms, nasal steroids are every bit as effective as oral antihistamine. Also, nasal corticosteroids can be useful for non-allergic coronitis. And so if you have somebody who's got both allergic and non-allergic uh, triggers, that could be uh, an appropriate choice for use. Local side effects of nasal steroids are generally minimal, but as I've alluded to, you can get into problems. Uh, nasal irritation and bleeding is probably one of the common uh, problems. Um, proper technique of avoiding the septum is important. And as I mentioned, there are rare cases of nasal septa perforation. Systemic side effects in adults are not significant. In children, there is no HPA axis suppression. But there are some um, concerns relative to growth. It depends on the product. It depends on the type of uh, methodology that was used. Much of the data is reassuring. However, the FDA um, was reviewing several years ago over-the-counter status for uh, nasal triamcinolone, which is now uh, approved. And they were looking at uh, some decrease in mean growth rate. So as a class, the labeling for nasal corticosteroids for over-the-counter use says that the uh, growth rate of some children might be slightly slower. And if a child needs to use the spray for longer than two months a year, uh, the parent should talk to the child's doctor with the idea of being looking at uh, possible alternatives to use uh, or possibly even monitoring uh, for uh, growth in the context of using the nasal steroids on an ongoing basis. OK, oral antihistamines, very commonly used. Um, they um, may be appropriate for PRN use because of the rapid onset. But a, a couple of key points. One is the guidelines are all uh, pretty consistent with avoiding uh, first generation sedating agents. This is not just because people can get subjective perception of sleepiness, but people can have performance impairment that they don't even sense. Um, that can be, for instance, in the case of driving, every bit as impaired as you could get with being inebriated, uh, legally drunk with alcohol. Also, first generation antihistamines can lead to disturbed sleep architecture. So even though people may sleep for X amount of hours, they actually may not have the same degree of rest that they would otherwise. And then there is uh, a problem with anticholinergic effects, not only um, and, and particularly uh, men with uh, urinary retention. But uh, a new concern that's been having um, more focus, and that is the risk for dementia from the anticholinergic agents used in seniors. So diphenhydramine, for instance, was implicated um, as being associated after three years of use with an increased risk of dementia. Decongestants come in oral and nasal forms. The oral forms, I uh, have to keep in mind, for pregnant women should be avoided uh, because they can increase the risk of uh, gastroschisis uh, if administered uh, in the first trimester of pregnancy. Also, patients can be vulnerable to hypertension. Some people just don't sleep as well with them. They can have more anxiety. Uh, one thing to keep in mind in this era of behind-the-counter availability of pseudoephedrine versus what's available over-the-counter phenylephrine, the evidence for effectiveness is much greater for the pseudoephedrine. But of course, because pseudoephedrine can be used by illegal methamphetamine labs, uh, we have that uh, restriction on the availability of pseudoephedrine. Relative to nasal decongestants, these are generally going to be more effective than the oral decongestants and do lack many of the cardiovascular and CNS side effects of oral decongestants. But uh, nasal decongestants, as we talked about, can be associated with tolerance and rebound rhinitis medicamentosa. I would put as an aside, though, that there are several uh, major studies recently that uh, indicate that if you can commonly administer a nasal steroid with a nasal decongestant, you're much less vulnerable, at least for a several week period, for developing rhinitis medicamentosa. Talking about intranasal antihistamines, these, um, in a comparative way, are less effective than nasal steroids for nasal symptoms. But as they say these things, in terms of you know, generally, more commonly, 
if we're talking about average responses, you have to keep in mind that there is some heterogeneity to rhinitis, just as there is with asthma. And for certain patients, they actually might do better with an intranasal corticosteroid, or an intranasal steroid rather than an intranasal corticosteroid. Um, nasal antihistamines do have clinically significant benefits on nasal congestion, probably more so than oral um, antihistamine. Nasal azelastine has an FDA indication for non-allergic vasomotor rhinitis. These agents also have the merit that they are uh, rapidly onset uh, with their action, so they could be appropriately used for PRN use. Um, major side effects are sedation and uh, um, taste perversion, and I do think the nose-to-toes approach that I mentioned earlier can gain better patient acceptance by reducing the uh, adverse taste uh, perception. This is just a meta-analysis that shows you what I just told you, and that is you're comparing on the left the uh, nasal steroids versus on the right the nasal antihistamine. Uh, by and large, the nasal steroids uh, are more effective. Oral antileukotriene agents are convenient to take. They're oral. Uh, approved down to H2 from Montelukast for seasonal allergic rhinitis. Um, the statement is made that the efficacy is similar to antihistamines, but usually this, the ca uh, caveat is that this is with loratadine as the usual comparator. Um, although the Joint Task Force in 2008 said that this could be an agent that would be considered when treatment can benefit the upper and lower airway, other guidelines um, are not so positive uh, about the role of uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists. In fact, the uh, 2015 AAO HNS guidelines said that clinicians should not offer oral leukotriene receptor antagonists as primary therapy for patients with allergic rhinitis. And that looked into risk-benefit considerations, also cost considerations. Also, the, um, there have been reports that uh, Montelukast is associated with neuropsychiatric events, and that has to be uh, kept in mind as well um, in the prescribing of these agents. In terms Dr. of this, yeah, yes? But, sorry, just a question. On the neuropsychiatric events, is that more like behavioral changes in kids, or can you see things in adults? Uh, you can see problems in adults, and I'll, I mean, I've seen anecdotally patients who are prone to depression that seem to be more depressed on it. Um, so I, I think it's uh, across the board. You could see it in kids. Um, the greatest concern probably was raised in adolescents, where there seemed to be uh, increased suicidal ideation in uh, some adolescents. But I think it's it's a potential problem across the board. Although I don't think it happens very commonly. We just have to keep this in mind. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Then we have intranasal anticholinergic agents, of which we got one uh, in the U.S., Ipratropium, which comes in two strengths. Uh, the 0.03 is for um, allergic rhinitis, whereas 0.06 is for acute uh, URI uh, usage. Uh, this can be very effective for reducing rhinorrhea, but really doesn't do anything for other symptoms of uh, allergic rhinitis. You also have to keep this in mind in your back pocket, though, because it can help reduce rhinorrhea from non-allergic rhinitis. Uh, it's dosed every 8 to 12 hours. There is rare, very rapid onset within 15, 30 minutes. So if you had somebody that was prone to having gustatory rhinitis and they were going out to dinner with friends and didn't want to have a social embarrassment from having a runny nose, you could have them take uh, just 15 minutes before uh, ipratropium to reduce the rhinorrhea that might occur. And again, because it is um, a uh, rapid onset agent, it uh, can be well suited for episodic environmental rhinitis or intermittent uh, rhinitis that just comes up uh, out of the blue. trying to advance the slides, but they are not advancing. Let's see if I, oh, you got it. Okay, here we go. Uh, intranasal chromalin is our last um, medication. Um, this, I think, has its greatest role for episodic environmental rhinitis, where just administering it even 15 minutes before allergen exposure can protect the patient for four to eight hours against allergic response. In contrast, 
the use is for maintenance treatment of allergic rhinitis, and certainly it's a very safe drug. So, um, you know, in pregnancy, you would actually have uh, very uh, good uh, safety considerations for its use. Uh, the onset of action is kind of slow, and also it might take even four or six weeks with ongoing use before you see full uh, benefit. So it's, I think, really more of a kind of a niche medication. Now, which of the following would be appropriate for treating non-allergic rhinitis? You've got a choice of oral antihistamines, oral antileukotrines, nasal chromalin, or nasal ipratropium. And really, of those, um, only the nasal ipratropium would be um, uh, of uh, likely value. Oral antihistamines, oral antileukotrines, and nasal chromalin generally are effective only for allergic, not for non-allergic rhinitis. And for non-allergic rhinitis, what we do have that can be of benefit is the uh, nasal corticosteroid class, nasal antihistamines, and nasal ipratropium for selectively the rhinorrhea. Now turning to combination therapy. So we'll start with the question. In a patient with seasonal allergic rhinitis, not controlled intranasal corticosteroid monotherapy, addition of which of the following has the best evidence for improving symptom relief? An intranasal antihistamine, an oral antihistamine, an oral leukotriene receptor antagonist, or an intranasal chromolyte? Well, the answer is the only one that really has good evidence is the addition of intranasal antihistamine. Um, and, um, you know, I think this brings up the point that very commonly we're often recommending people take uh, nasal steroids along with oral antihistamines. However, if you look at um, across the board mean responses, uh, it's difficult to demonstrate that there's any uh, better benefit uh, for rhinitis symptoms with the use of a combination approach with oral antihistamines and the nasal steroids as opposed to monotherapy with a nasal steroid. So this is actually one question that we're dealing with on the Joint Task Force now. And there's a proposed statement that uh, we might soften a bit, but based on the evidence we've got, um, there is not any clinical benefit to adding an oral antihistamine to an intranasal steroid, at least for most patients. Incidentally, the Joint Task Force uh, Rhinitis Work Group is working with the evidence-based medicine group there at Children's Mercy, and they are uh, really an integral, very appreciated part of the, the process of uh, looking at the literature that's available. Now, the combination of an intranasal uh, antihistamine and a nasal steroid um, has been shown to lead to better improvement than either agent used as monotherapy. There is a combination nasal product that is available. Um, of course, you can also um, prescribe a separate spray with a nasal steroid and a nasal antihistamine, but then you get into an issue about having to wait uh, between sprays so that everything just doesn't drip out. I tend to tell people, uh, this is just based on my experience, try to wait about 10 minutes before uh, taking your second spray. Um, and then if you're talk talking about a patient with mixed rhinitis, um, conceptually, there can be significant added benefit of the combination of both a nasal antihistamine to a nasal steroid with the idea both of those as monotherapies um, can be uh, of benefit for both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis. This just shows you one uh, particular study um, which looked at mean improvement in total nasal symptom scores over the course of the study. And so obviously the higher the number, the greater the improvement, the better the result. And you see there with the data in circles um, that you lead to better improvement than using monotherapy with the uh, square data, which is the nasal antihistamine versus the triangle plotted data, which is the nasal corticosteroid. How about the combination of an oral antihistamine with a leukotriene receptor antagonist? This is kind of a weak situation. Um, the last practice parameter iteration said that this could be used as an alternative treatment for patients unresponsive to or not compliant with nasal steroids. And I think that's still a reasonable consideration. However, um, if you look at studies 
that try to compare monotherapy with each of these agents versus combined therapy of an oral antihistamine and oral leukotriene receptor antagonist, you don't see um, a good consistent superiority with the combination therapy. And uh, certainly the combo of the, um, uh, those two oral agents is uh, less effective than even monotherapy with an intranasal corticosteroid. Going to cut by that one, which is demonstrated what I just showed you. Uh, but I want to get done in time here. So, got a, now a patient with negative skin test to arrow allergen. They got year-round rhinorrhea, but no significant complaints of nasal congestion. Nasal ipratropium gives some but inadequate relief. Is there evidence basis for adding a nasal corticosteroid? And the answer is yes. Uh, there can be an additive effect of intranasal ipratropium and an intranasal corticosteroid on rhinorrhea. Here we see one study um, that was looking at the uh, mean duration of rhinorrhea throughout uh, the course of the, that was actually the number of days during the course of treatment uh, that people were experiencing rhinorrhea. And in a comparative way, you're looking up at uh, placebo up on the top with the open circles. Uh, then ipratropium in squares, um, in triangle, and there's the corticosteroid. And then down in the, uh, the diamond, uh, the combination of the two, which led to a better result. So in terms of the thought paradigm, when your symptoms aren't controlled in a patient, Whichever medication is first selected should either be considered to be switched out, substituted, or if appropriate, uh, added to something else in a combination regimen, which of course hopefully is a regimen that uh, has some demonstrated uh, additive benefit. Now, this sort of is, I think, uh, uh, one of the key slides of the presentation, and this is what I'm going to end with, because, you know, in this day and age, people often have come into us, kids and adults, um, with trying over-the-counter medicines. We're talking about they've tried oral antihistamines. In many cases now, they've tried uh, nasal corticosteroids. Uh, or maybe you're seeing them in follow-up. You made a nice, very thoughtful, selected prescription of medications, but they come back and they say they're still having problems. Well, first thing to always check about is, are they actually complying with therapy? And this is true for, of course, any medical condition, but it's particularly true in rhinitis because studies show that compliance adherence rates are not very good in a lot of patients. Uh, also, are they... Um, using the medication effectively. I mean, maybe they were taking a nasal steroid, but they were squirting it in, and it was immediately dripping out and uh, going over some techniques on how to get better retention of the preparation in the nose it may lead to better benefit. Of course, you're then going to have the dilemma if the patient's not doing well, do you switch to a different medicine or the, with a the monotherapy or actually step up to a combo therapy? You should also keep in mind our there are unaddressed triggers or environmental factors at play. I mean, if the uh, person is allergic, for instance, to pets, and the pet's still in the home, that's going to reduce the likelihood that you're going to get uh, great benefit from treatment. Also be mindful that there could be alternative or comorbid, comorbid diagnoses. That could include uh, rhinosinusitis, uh, acid reflux, as examples. Uh, you would ask, therefore, about heartburn, uh, just one question. Uh, then you would also want to know if there are anatomic issues, uh, septal deviation, turbinate hypertrophy. You know, sometimes your next step might be to give another go at another round of a medication approach. Um, other times, even at that juncture, uh, maybe the second visit, you might uh, look at the need for doing further diagnostic studies such as rhinoscopy or ultimately CT sinuses. Um, if a rhinoscopy would be appropriate and you don't do it, then you should consider referral to somebody who could, such as an otolaryngologist. Also, for things like inferior turbinate hypertrophy, um, there are surgical reduction uh, approaches that can be used to reduce uh, partially the inferior turbinates that can lead to uh, good improvement in nasal symptoms. You have to keep that in mind. 
And then, of course, for allergic rhinitis, always consider uh, the uh, possible role of allergen immunotherapy if patients aren't uh, uh, improving as they should. And although I know Dr. Nelson um, is or will be presenting uh, another lecture on allergen immunotherapy, there also would be an indication for allergen immunotherapy for patients who are doing well but want to uh, reduce their long-term requirement for medication. So that's the end of my uh, formal presentation. We have a Uh, really tip down right after that. It, uh, I, I, my experience is when you tell people to do other positions to actually apply the spray, you get in all sorts of convoluted positions that don't work, and so I try to keep it simple, um, spray while they're upright, but then uh, right after that, dip down. Um, my second and third question relate to therapy. So um, based on the practice parameters and, and what you've discussed, is it recommended that non-allergic rhinitis be treated with nasal ipratropium as your first-line monotherapy, or is it steroids? And the second uh, question refers to uh, saline irrigation. I noticed you did not mention that, and I wonder if that has a role. Uh, well, the last question is easy. Yes, saline irrigation can have a role, um, and uh, of course there are different types of um, commercial products, uh, devices that can be used. You might as well mention like Neomed and, and uh, sinus rinse and neti pots. Uh, and people, particularly if they got a lot of mucus, can um, get some good benefit with that. A key point to keep in mind is if they're going to do that, they should do that before they start spraying in all their pharmacotherapy into the nose. And I usually talk about people after using the saline rinses of waiting maybe about 10 minutes or so for them to drip out everything before they put in the intranasal preparation. Um, the other thing in terms of non-allergic rhinitis, uh, you know, most patients with non-allergic rhinitis are going to be um, giving you several different symptoms, not just rhinorrhea, but potentially congestion. Uh, and for that, um, using a nasal steroid or a nasal antihistamine would be probably more first line. On the other hand, there are some people that are predominantly bothered by rhinorrhea, and if that's the case, you could make a case of just using epitropium monotherapy as a first-line agent. So you really sort of have to tailor to the patient and the particular symptoms that they are being bothered with uh, with their non-allergic rhinitis. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think we have a question online. Um, I think that you mentioned a study describing the association between dementia and oral antihistamine. Are you less likely to recommend oral antihistamines because of this? Um, the important distinction here, and I was going to try to see if I can get back to that slide, is first generation versus later generation antihistamines. That is to say, the um, uh, dating antihistamines, here we are, that have um, anticholinergic side effects along with them. Um, the Newer agents, such as, for instance, sexafenidine and the whole context of everything, maybe they're not that new, but things like loratadine, um, they don't have significant anticholinergic effects, and they have not yet been identified to be an issue relative to this dementia uh, concern. So this is um, looking at that slide specifically for uh, sedating first-generation antihistamines that have associated anticholinergic effects. And it's thought that the anticholinergic um, is what's being associated with the dementia. So that, that's the key point there. All right. Well, I, I see no other questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Yeah. Dykowitz, and uh, hopefully things will be uh, not quite as warm in St. Louis as they are in Kansas City today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, good day. Thank Bye. you. Good day.